it's great to see you all and it's great to see colleagues from the Department of Defence and um, General, good to see you and colleagues from the Army and from the Naval Service and from the Air Corps. But we're here really to um, listen to Maureen. Maureen's been a friend of mine for probably too long. Nearly 42 years. 42 years, a long time to be idle. So, yeah. But um, we're delighted, delighted to, to invite or to welcome you here, Maureen, for uh, in your role as Deputy Military Advisor to the UN Under Secretary General for Peace Operations. And we're delighted you've given your generous time. I think it would be appropriate if I just paused for a moment uh, yesterday and on Monday, uh, on Monday evening I was at the removal, but yesterday morning I was at the funeral and the day before the removal of Adele Doris, Captain Adele Doris, a, a classmate of Maureen. And I think our thoughts uh, should be with her. Roger, Kate, and um, Owen, her son. And I suppose in that point, we also remember um, Maureen's other classmate, Mary Jo, who was also a close friend of mine, who died some time ago, but she was also in the same class with Mary Jo. And we think about her and Parik and Christian, her son. So if you would like to bear with us for about 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, Maureen will talk to us. And then we'll go into a Q&A session. And I have... Um, uh, for those who are online, I welcome all those who are online, we'll take your questions through the chat function on the Zoom system. Um, please identify yourself if you have a question and the institution, if there is one to which you are affiliated. Um, and we will come to that at the end of the presentation for um, from Mary Ma Maureen. All the questions and the presentation will be on the record. Please feel free to use the Twitter handle at IIEA. And we're also, as I said, live streaming. So we're very happy to take the discussion from those who are on YouTube. Um, so now to formally introduce Maureen, um, and I didn't hand her over to you. Major General Maureen O'Brien graduated from University College Galway with a BSc and a HDIP in education before being awarded a cadetship in Oakley Nahiran in 1981. And since then, she has held many different appointments in operations, training, and strategic planning. Maureen has achieved a number of firsts for women in the Irish Defence Forces, becoming the first woman to be promoted to Lieutenant Colonel in 2011. And in 2021, she was appointed to her current role as Deputy Military Advisor to the UN Under Secretary General for Peace Operations. During her career, Major General O'Brien has amassed extensive overseas service, most recently as Deputy Force Commander in UNDOF uh, in Syria, and prior to that, peacekeeping operations in Chad and Lebanon, I think East Timor as well, and elsewhere, I think perhaps. Uh, later this week, Maureen uh, will be awarded the University of Galway's Alumni Award for Law, Public Policy and Society. So I'd also like to extend my congratulations to you, Maureen, on that uh, outstanding achievement. So, Maureen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Sir, <clears throat> um, it's, it's funny. Um, in 2008, I did a thesis on UN Resolution 1325, and the title was uh, UN Resolution One. 325, just add women and stir, a recipe for gender stereotyping in the in UN peacekeeping operations. And little did I think that I would then be in the UN headquarters where I could affect some change uh, in my current role as Dean Millet. Um, and as it happens, and I'll discuss it later, what I saw in 2008 did come to pass. There was some, and there still is some stereotyping that we'll have to uh, deal with. So, I, I, I read some notes and there will be some ad lib and I'll give an opportunity for speaking then and don't be afraid to ask questions. I won't necessarily have all the answers, but I can give you the benefit of the experience I have had. So you'll all, have, all know, of course, that UN Resolution 1325, Women, Peace and Security is generally regarded as the most important commitment made by the global community to incorporate a gender perspective in the maintenance of peace and security. The Security Council formally recognized the different impacts of armed conflict on women and men. And one of the aims of the <clears throat> resolution is to expand the role and contribution of women in the UN field operations. So um, when I did my thesis, I examined the literature and the policies from the UN, and I found that the UN, UN basically essentialized men and women into different characteristics. And by doing so, they stereotyped women into one, uh, women are good and soft and men are violent and, <clears throat> and uh, aggressive. 
And this goes through all of the documentation that I found. And so um, when I got to New York, I wanted to see what was the cause of that and uh, whether I could change that perspective, because I think it's an impediment towards the actual, um, what, what the UN resolution is trying to do, increase the role. It's not just about numbers. So um, unfortunately that perspective is also shared by troop contributing nations. They also um, consider, they stereotype women into certain roles in order to get their numbers of women in their forces up. And when you're working with the UN and the troop contributing countries, believing that there is a difficulty and it is difficult to shift. Um, so more about that later. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the work that the Office of Military Affairs that I work in. Office of Military Affairs is part of the uh, Department of Peace Operations. It has 100, approximately 100, 600 officers from 40 different nationalities. We have just 100 people to plan, deploy, assess, and conduct intelligence work um, for 12 different peacekeeping missions 68,000 people, 68,000 people. And I asked myself when I arrived in the UN and I saw that we, OMA had one sort of three quarters of a sliver of one floor. What in fact was everybody else doing? Um, now they're doing a lot of work, but certainly what I'm, point I'm making is the very, the, the small um, dedication to the, to the people who were on the ground, the 68,000 people. That's what struck me. It still strikes me. <laughs> so, um, so OMA, what we're trying to do in the context of women, peace and security is we're trying to reach gender parity. And there is a UN uh, uniformed gender par parity strategy and basically it sets targets for years from 2018 up to 2028. Some of them are being achieved and some are not. So, um, so the, yeah, okay. So from May 2020 to today, together with the member states, we've managed to increase the share of women deployed as individual uniform personnel by 3.3% uh, from 18.1% in 2020. It's all figures, right? Yeah. Um, to 21.4% in April 2023. So we're currently achieving that strategy, uh, the gender target for this year already. Now, the difficulty uh, I'll say about the, the individual uniformed personnel are basically staff officers and UNMOs. And what we will find is that troop contributing countries find it more easy to, to appoint females into those positions um, because they don't distract, they're not com necessarily combat related. Although, if you don't know what goes on a contingent, it is very difficult, in my opinion, to be a staff officer who would. Um, who would be involved with contingents. So it's like you have to understand what's going on, on the ground to be an operations officer. And sometimes then what you find is those women from different nationalities who, who don't do combat roles is that they have to work extra hard to understand what's going on and extra hard to be seen to be doing the right job. And we put an unfair burden on them as well. So for contingents then the progress is slower. We have a modest increase from 4.83% in 2020 to 6.5 in April 2023. So <clears throat> why, why, as I explained, but basically most troop contributing countries, and I'll call them TCCs, um, most TCCs do not have women in what they call combat roles, in infantry roles, normal soldiering. And if they have, they're only starting. And so they haven't reached um, a stage where they could be maybe a chief of staff of a mission or a deputy chief of staff are our deputy force commander, are a force commander. So that's the difficulty we have. Um, and so what they happen to be is then they, they, which I will say is they've got these females and they put them into stereotypical roles. So in terms of leadership though, which is not all about the numbers, uh, women continue to be represented by me uh, um, um, as the Dean Milad, but also we have a force commander in <clears throat> Cyprus, major general as well. And up to recently, we had a deputy force commander in Syria. And, but we do have currently one uh, deputy force commander as Brigadier General in Western Sahara. Um, <clears throat> on the 4th of July, the, the force commander of Cyprus will move back to Norway. 
And on the 4th of July, when there's a big party, I will be leaving the mission after two years. So it's going to be a big party, fireworks and all, just to get rid of us, okay? So, but what it will mean then is at that point in time, there will only be one Brigadier General female in the 12 peacekeeping missions that we have. And I'm not even aware that we have a colonel, but that rotates every six months and a year, so that could change. So what um, concrete measures have we done in, the, in OMA? What we do is we, if, uh, for example, if a TCC is providing a number of staff officers for a particular mission, we insist that a number of those are female. It is, that's just a fact. We don't, don't allow all female. Um, pr we prioritize equally qualified women candidates for uniform appointments in the Office of Military Affairs. Uh, um, but I also have to do a regional balance. So this is a bit chop and changing. But I'll tell you, one of the things that we did recently is that, um, well, I did this and I'm very proud of this and see how it works. Um, some TCCs to put, would put nominate up to 20 people for one appointment and it could be more. And that puts a huge burden on us because we have to process all of those and they don't prioritize them. In the case, say, of Ireland, they'd only put one name forward, assuming they put the best person forward. So this time what we said is in line with the gender policy, the parity policy, we would accept as many people as they wanted, as long as 25 percent included suitably qualified women. So that means what essentially is going to happen is they will only be able to nominate three men. And what's that going to do in the end? The guys at the back, you know, said, I'm not going to get a chance to go to the UN, which is highly coveted, unless we have a suitably qualified woman. That means they have to open the courses to the women so to ensure that they have the same experiences uh, as the men. So we'll see how that works out. They're complaining at the moment. Yeah, I'm not listening. Um, we also have engagement platoons, and I had, when I was told about these engagement platoons in 2019, I said, well, you can forget it. Ireland's not going to do that. Engagement platoons were seen at the time as being 100% women, and what they did is their function was to engage with the local population, all very admirable. I'm not saying that the, 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 what the engagement platoon does is not right, and as a battalion commander, certainly I would use engagement platoon. But to say that it must be 100% women is, is wrong, in my opinion, because the population is 50-50 at least. Now, in, in most of the countries that we are deployed, it would, be a difficult, it would be difficult for men to talk to women, and that's recognized. But the unintended consequence of this is that women were basically, uh, I use the word corralled, because I've heard this being used before, corralled into, you go to the engagement platoon. So, I said, there's no way Ireland do with that. We spend a fortune training our, our women and men as more, you know, APC drivers, you know, highly qualified professional people. And then you say, you're going to an engagement platoon because you're a woman, simply because you're a woman. Not even because you've been able, you've been trained uh, in the work that you're supposed to do. They're just put there. So I've, I've met uh, a particular officer who was in charge of an engagement platoon in South Sudan. And she was an engineer. What a waste of talent, right? Um, anyway, so what we have done to change that now, it has to be 50-50 men and women, and they have to be trained. So, but it has to be said as well, for those women who are not combatant or will not be considered any, in any other role, it's a great opportunity to go overseas. And their work is very valuable. Uh, you shouldn't dismiss the engagement platoon altogether. So um, in enabling environments are one of the things we're trying to work on as well. A recent focus on the work has shifted away from numbers to a discussion on creating enabled environments for women and men to be able to participate in a full, equal and meaningful way. We work on outstanding potential, understanding the potential barriers to women and men's full, equal and meaningful participation related to the work that they're doing. Um, in this context, we have recently conducted a survey to gain a better understanding on deployment experiences. Now, this is not rocket science. And if I hear of one more <laughs> survey being done on barriers, we know what the barriers are. We know that the TCCs are not employing um, women fairly and they are not pushing, putting them in, allowing, allowing them into um, what they consider to be combat roles. Um, we were closely working with the conduct and discipline service here in New York, well, in New York, 
on how to prevent and respond to sexually har sexual harassment. For example, in consultation with our um, conduct and dis discipline uh, colleagues, OMA has recently sent out a communique to the military components about zero tolerance against sexual harassment, abuse, and discrimination. Um, and not to be and and to be an active when you see something to be active in reporting it and to report it straight away. We have also integrated lessons on how to create an enabling environment in guidelines and new training materials. For instance, we have developed innovative case study handbook on gender, peace and security for UN infantry battalions in peace operations and other military personnel. That one is fine. It's on its final review. It contains practical scenario based case studies for UN infantry battalions at command and planning level, as well as for troops. Um, another example is the guidelines on how to integrate a gender perspe perspective into the work of the military component, which have been recently updated. They include important lessons on how to integrate a gender perspective into the work of the military component of UN peace operations at strategic operational and tactical levels. Um, the Canadians have set up what they call an LC initiative, where they um, basically are, are providing accommodation, suitable accommodation for women um, in a number of missions. <clears throat> it is the TCC's responsibility to provide the, the, um, the accommodation at the early stage and the mission support who's supposed to, to maintain that. Um, the difficulty I have with this, again, is that uh, corralling women into a corner and all of them go down to one corner, it's locked up, etc. Because all we do, of course, is we paint our nails and plait our hair. And we have so much in common. All ranks have everything in common. We, you know, just because we're women again, we could be plunked there. I have objected to this because as, as women um, progress through the ranks, we don't want to be for command purposes. You cannot be in the same place as the troops are. If I'm battalion commander, do you think for one minute I'm going to be down and corralled in, 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 uh, in a, a little place? Uh, no, thank you very much. So there has to be a little bit more thought put into that. Now, it does suit some particular TCCs who like corralling their women. Um, and, and, and I'm using that word because that's the word that was used to me. Um, but they have already done three pilot programs in Monosco, in Congo, um, Mali, and uh, in UNISFA, which is a mission between South Sudan and Sudan. Um, I've seen them myself. They are very, very, very good accommodations. But it's the way every accommodation should be. We should be raising the standard for everybody, not just women. And, you know, when I joined the Defence Forces first, one of the arguments was, you know, we don't have any accommodation. We don't have the proper toilets. And I said, if they're not proper toilets and accommodation for me, they're not proper and good enough for men. That didn't go down terribly well. Um, our military leaders and heads of missions have participated in sessions on gender responsive leadership, which will contribute to strengthening leadership's uh, capabilities in this area. Interestingly, um, during the time that I've been in UN, a lot of um, ASGs, my level and above, we underwent a gender responsive leadership course, which was very, very good. And you know what? You think you know it all, but you don't. You have to keep on reminded. I mean, the basic things is the language we use. Um, if the language we use is not um, inclusive, um, you know, we have to think about that. For example, the, the word manpower was used all the time. I have a particular and I've always had a particular dislike for that, um, for that word, because it's not inclusive. And it is, it is um, banned in the Office of Military Affairs. And I think what it does, sometimes it de dehumanizes people and um, it doesn't take into account that we're all individuals. So <clears throat> even just small languages, I mean, some people in my, in the Office of Military Affairs never saw a female officer, let alone a general, you know? So, and I was being called <clears throat> sir for a long time. <clears throat> and, um, but they thought that was, a good thing. I was an honorary man. So I understood it wasn't, um, it wasn't, <laughs> I will say derogatory, but uh, certainly it wasn't what I wanted. So we changed that. So we've included these in our standard, standard operating procedures, everything we do, all our documentation, everything that we 
produce has a gender focus or is at least gender, you know, that, that they think about the words. I have people thinking about the words now. I mean, when the word ma comes out of their mouth, you could see them going, ah, a personnel or whatever, yeah, yeah. So at least I think I've made a difference in that, that respect. How long that will last after I go, I don't know. Um, so we also have, um, in each mission, we have gender, uh, gender focal points. Indeed, in each unit, there's a gender focal point. And I think some people get mixed up on what that person is supposed to do. But in any event, um, the fact that they're all women is not helpful. And we've tried to change that. Um, so we have a community of gender focal points. And um, there's, um, we have a resource hub set up for them as well. Um, the first we've conducted the first uh, UN military gender advisors was, of course, in, in 2021. And we have initiated the development and pilot of the first network for uniformed women peacekeepers in June 2023. Now, not sure that will work either, but let's see how it goes. You know, there's a lot of people who think, who think they know an awful lot about military people. There's a lot of civilians I often in, in the UN thank them for their military advice. Um, my 42 years obviously didn't, didn't count for much. Um, we have done some research and partnerships and also um, we, this is a very interesting one actually. In 2021, we launched a new set of gender parity reports, which receive positive feedback from the different stakeholders, including the TCCs. One, this report is seven, sent to them every month to, to the, the TCCs. And what it tells them is the, how they are reaching our, the targets that we've set in terms of gender. It does a lot more than that, but it's sometimes very good when you see it in a nice little pie chart, how badly they're doing. Um, so we also have a military gender advocate of the year award, um, show, showcasing the extraordinary individuals um, and their distinct contribution to peacekeeping that they have made. This year, the winner was um, from Ghana, an extraordinary woman who was actually a platoon commander of an engagement platoon, which she took it very seriously. She was very qualified and had trained in it beforehand and expected an awful lot from the women and men, men that she did. She had plans, plans of what they wanted to achieve. I mean, it has to be said, these engagement platoons are a force protection measure as well, and intel intelligence gathering. They're not all soft and cuddly. Um, and I did talk to you about the engagement platoons. It is important to have women seen as well, because, you know, we're trying to be reflective of the communities that we serve, and they include women. So, um, so that's about increasing the numbers. But, you know, does that, where does that go? Does that um, lead us to, um, that's just adding the women and stirring, right? Um, to have the full, equal, and meaningful participation of women envisaging the resolution, I think we have to go further. So I think we have to work harder at getting women into more leadership roles. And this is difficult when in, in the militaries, as I said, in some TCCs, that they don't have, they're not training to, in the combat roles. And this has to change. Um, I will go off, off script here, but, um, you know, there's a number of, I will just name the num no, I won't name them, number of TCCs who are very proud of the huge contribution they have made in terms of numbers. And it is extraordinary the number of people that they have deployed all over the, the, the 12 missions. But there's a competition between the four of them of who has the most. But I've turned it and I said, you know, we're not talking about numbers here anymore. We're talking about, as they do, they say, how many force commanders we have? How many deputy force commanders have you got? And I'm doing now, and how many females have you got? How many have you got in the contingents? And that's what I'm comparing. Now, the bottom line I say to them is that if you do not include women in those roles, in the planning, in the operations, you're going to get this group think it's going to be the same story, the same result all the time. But if you include any form of diversity, you're going to you're going to mix that up and get a better product in the end. So not alone is it important for UN Resolution 135 so that we're seen to be doing the right thing. It is important in terms of the effectiveness of the unit or the military themselves. So when I speak to representatives from these four nations, I said, say to them, you know you are becoming a less effective force. 
you have you have now taken on that you use the word risk management yet you are now allowing yourself potentially to be less good and efficient and effective through just thinking the same way um, then your country beside you, your neighbor beside you and when they hear that when they hear that the country beside them possibly has started more work nepal for example has started work they've seen that their their own internal um, uh, hostilities they found that their women are fighting against them so why shouldn't there be women fighting for them or with them and and the more you have and the more senior women you have the more invested the more the more invested the women become the more it changes the dynamic of the whole culture of that that uh, military changes and to a certain extent numbers are awfully important to get to that sort of critical number but if you don't have role models if you don't have people who in senior positions that can affect change there will be no change um What we do too, there's just ways that I can uh, ensure that we try to get women. I, I told you about, you know, if they don't, I contacted all of the military police units in the 12 missions to see if they included, for example, that there are women in, in the, the peacekeeping in the military police unit, because that would be awfully important considering there are men and women in all of the camps. So um, I found out one TCC didn't have, and I contacted their military advisor in UN, and he said, well, it's not our culture. And I said, well, you know what it is? It is the UN culture. And if you don't change, we'll replace you. Funny enough, it was their culture. They got it in the end. So, you know, demanding that people change. And, and, and you know, I know culture is important, but it's not culture in a lot of the cases. It's not, it's about not sharing and not wanting and underestimating. The amount of time that I've been underestimated, it's great to be a woman sometimes because you can only surprise people if you're, you know, if, you, if they continually underestimate you. Um, so that's one way we do it. So, you know, there's subtle ways that we can achieve this and it starts them thinking. If they're not selected, if, you know, if somebody's not selected, for example, we were doing an interview or we were trying to identify a senior position who would go for it. I looked at the TCC, I looked at their track record in terms of how many people they had, how many women they had, and many and in that particular mission. And the decision was between two. And that was what decided in the end how many women they had, particularly at the higher level. And that's that's what I went for. So they were, I suppose, it is a bit carrot and stick, but unfortunately, that's the only thing that that works. Now, I think I've come nearly to the end of the official stuff. Yeah, just one thing about how people say, well, why do you need women there? You know, I've, I, I'm, I'm stopped. I don't justify it anymore. There is no need. I don't bother. I did that back in 19, uh, what was it, 81? Just why we should. You know, I, that's not important anymore. Let's move on. That battle is gone. That's well, having said that, there are still people talking to talking about. Um, I went to the, um, the US War College in, in uh, Rhode Island. And there were still conversations about whether or not women should be in the military or in the Navy, in particular parts. They're hung up with, the, as, as a lot of people are, with the physical standards. And the thing is, you know, they don't include flexibility in these physical standards. If they did, half the men wouldn't pass it. Yeah. And the idea that they can understand the physical standards are lowered as you get older, they can get that but can't get that there might be a different standard for women. I said, explain that to me. So anyway, I've, I've told you, I, I haven't st stuck to my notes, but I think I, I leave it there. Yeah, thank you very much. Morning. So just to remind everybody, um, those online and those here, use the hashtag at IIEA. And um, we're open for questions, and I have some questions coming in there. But just to recap on some points, and I think you opened up with the point of stereotyping and the, the progress since then. And I, I always think of the, the 2019 uh, BT Young Scientists winners uh, who were Ballancotic Secondary School 
who actually won it at the award on the fact that women are children as five to seven female children are being stereotyped by their five to seven year old classmates. Mm. And so it's, it's still there a societal issue. But what I am impressed is, is the enabling environment and all the strategy that you have outlined there, dealing with the issue of zero tolerance to sexual harassment, integrating the gender perspective, the issue of gender responsible leadership, the issue of having gender advisors. I'm delighted that Aoife and Jane Lawler are here. You, you've blazed a trail in terms of ensuring that gender advisors within our defense forces are institutionalized and also looking for gender uh, parity, the gender parity report. And finally, you know, the, the, the pursuing uh, role models because, you know, can't see, can't be. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the critical piece. And, and on that point, I just want to commend you for your leadership. So I, I have a question here from Emer Stewart, and I'll start with that. And please, we'll have a roving mic uh, if necessary. She, Emer is a student at University of Limerick, and she said the Defence Forces has translated the women, peace and security agenda extremely well whilst working on the ground with civilians during peacekeeping operations. But she wants to know how well has the WPS, Women, Peace and Security Agenda, been translated within the ranks of the Defence Forces itself? I can't speak for that and I'm not going to speak about the Irish Defence Forces we yeah. don't and that is a different conversation. Uh, in my capacity in as D Millad, I'm not actually Irish, I'm an international civil servant who happens to be seconded. So I I Yeah, I think I, you probably felt with it in yeah. terms of, of, of yeah. from a policy perspective. Yeah. And uh, I see uh, Brigadier General Jerry Hearn he raises the point that troops in combat roles are deployed to UN forces are predominantly from Asia and Africa. And what efforts are ongoing to rebalance the geographical spread of TCCs deploying? And is there any growing appetite for European forces to engage in deploying forces to UN forces? Very good question. I, I, I've met the uh, I've met a lot of European forces. In, in Africa, when French moved out, Burkan moved out, it left a gap, a vacuum. And I, I think actually Europe may, this is my opinion, not the UN opinion, uh, may have by moving out of a number of missions in Africa, they have actually left a vacuum for others to fill. And that was the reason they left, that others were there. And now they've left a vacuum that the others can completely use. Um, I had the exact same question asked by a German. The Germans are moving out of um, Mali in by, Fe by February or March next year. Um, asking who's replacing it, I said. Well, you know, really, who's replacing the judges? It's really they should, and they don't need to know that. We are working hard at doing that. We might not be able to get the same capability, but we're doing our very best. The trouble is, as, as General has said, that it is the same TCCs again, the Africans, the Asians that are going forward. Um, and, and the reason for, there are many reasons for that. There, there would appear to me to be a two-level, two-tiered kind of military. Those who, if I may say, and I say to others that, take care of soldiers who respect that a year's deployment is not is too long in these austere conditions six months is the correct the un used to do six months for deployments now they do it for a year and that's all about money not nothing else but there are issues about we'll say um with six month deployments in that you know you're no sooner there but you're left and you're making up you're making relationships and you need to continue those relationships. So what I've said is, yes, we can do that. We can have military people there for up to four years. Just contract us. Pay for it. Oh, no, we don't need them that much. Um, so um, the efforts, we see, it's Africa. It should be, there should be African troops. Mm. Uh, and I believe that. And I know that one of the force commanders recently who left, who was from Europe, said it should have been an African force commander. Um, I can't say any better than that. They're okay. their foreign policies, so, you know, I don't always agree with them. Yeah. Declan, you, mm. you have a question. Hi, Declan. There's a microphone. Um, Declan Power, um, I'm on the Security and Defence Group with the IAEA now. Um, to amplify points that you made there and that General Hearn made as well, in my own experience, it seemed in Africa that where you had a conglomeration of African forces, and I get the point about African boots on the ground to solve African problems, and I largely agree with that. But if you want to change the culture, particularly with about integrating women, I think it makes sense to try and have a, 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 some sort of injection of Western uh, troops uh, at different ranks and levels, because explaining the concepts about integration of women or you know, other concepts that are sometimes alien to some of the forces with say uh, human rights uh, 
uh, points as well, doesn't work until they see it in action. And in that note, the question I would ask is sometimes Kofi Annan himself said in 96, I think, that he wished there, were, there, there was a NATO in Africa, that he could contract missions to the same way he's done elsewhere. Is there a role for, uh, for conglomerates like the EU, like NATO, to get more involved in integrated missions? And is there any appetite for that in the West? Because it would rise all tides, integration of women, human rights, uh, military operating capacity. Yeah, very good. Um, in fact, I think NATO are actually trying to get more involved in the integrated, the more comprehensive approach. NATO is strictly military up to now, really but they want to get involved in the political side, which the UN has experience in, whether it's successful or not is another day's work. But it's at least it's there and at least it's trying. Um, we're looking at partnerships. We're looking at, we're looking at how peacekeeping will change the future. We have a huge amount of challenges in the missions that we have at the moment. One of which is the host countries that asked us to go there no longer want us or curtail the work that we do. We have reduced freedom of movement. Um, and so we can't do what we want. They bring on other partners, which they're just entitled to do, but restrict our activity within particular zones that those other parties are in. So uh, we can't uh, have, so there's a difficulty there. Um, and the, there are, is no peace to keep in a lot of these places as well. Um, and every day there's a new armed group that that that, that runs. But basically, our role in, in Africa predominantly is uh, protection of civilians until there, there is a political agenda and a, a way forward. Yeah, I, I think there, I think there is. But I think you what you might find actually between the EU, NATO, and the UN is a little bit of not wanting to share either. Yeah, I, I just. Uh... Yeah, I, I, I come to you in a moment. I just was reflecting there on and one of the questions that come in, come in here is the statistics with regards to um, female involvement in peace negotiations and oversight of implementation of peace, peace accords and the remarkable um, gap in terms of the success where women are involved vis-a-vis -vis if they're not involved. And I, I see a question here from Mary Van Leishout of Goal. She wants to know, um, you know, in your own career, how many, how can we get more women leaders in the global south into local peace talks? I presume, with view to that point. Mm, I, I think I've asked this question myself. You know, we're torturing ourselves in the military trying to get more and more women. I don't see the political side of the house working as hard. And if only for the Office of Military Affairs, I have to tell you that the gender balance and the uh, regional balance would be skewed. Only for we do our work, we have 40 different nationalities. So I, I do ask that question, how can we get, how, why aren't there women there? I think the way to do it is not through the military now, obviously, it's through political human rights, et cetera, is, is the network of women on the ground mm. and making sure they have a voice. Now that's not traditionally acceptable in a number of countries, but maybe we have to make it acceptable mm. because there's no change. I mean, the reason that there are, there are um, conflicts is because it, reasons of inequality of some sort. Mm. And that's basically, I mean, the most basic of inequalities is the inequality in gender. And if that's not sorted, and if there's no representation, even if there is some peace, it's only a peace for a while and it's cyclical and it comes back. So yes, they have to be involved. I think that the, the, the UN has to try harder and getting, um, working with women's groups on the ground. Mm. But you see, there is a disconnect between the people at the headquarters, if they've had a coup or whatever it is, it's full of men. They do not want to share that power with somebody else. They're, they don't have a democratic perspective. Um, and so what the people on the ground want, what the women, what the men, the civilians want, isn't necessarily what they want. So um, there's a little bit of a, a pull and push there. Yeah, I think it's remarkable when you look at the Global Peace Index, and you look at the defaulters, the countries that are uh, experiencing most interstate and intrastate violence, mm -hmm. and you look at the gender gap index, where, mm -hmm. which is a measure of women who are not involved in politics, who are not educated, who are not employed, or who are uh, oppressed. The countries with the greatest gender gap index mm -hmm. are the same countries that have interstate and mm -hmm. intrastate violence. Absolutely. I, I just um, will pick up on a, a question here from, sorry, excuse me. I, I'll take your question, please. 
I'm Audrey McCready, a citizen. Um, my question kind of boils down to, I suppose, there's a risk of jumping straight into the stereotypical traps um, of, you know, if we had more women in the military, 50-50, my goodness, um, would we have less war? And, you know, is there a stereotype against men as well? Mm. I mean, is there still a very predominant culture of mm. men having to be warriors? Mm. Because, you know, thank goodness we have men who are artists, musicians and mm. architects as well. Um, so there's, you know, how significant is the gender thing in, in the whole question? Uh, you're dead right. And actually in my thesis, I said, you know, basically in the end, you know, this gender stereotyping damages men as well, because we're not, you're not just one dimensional people. We're very complex. Everyone is complex. There are men who don't like war. There are women who don't like war. And nobody wants to be involved in a war. I want to be involved as a, in, as a member of the UN and, and the Defence Forces of Ireland because I want peace, not because I want war. So, um, but some people are pushed to that because they have no other alternatives. But that idea, the idea that I spoke about, about having including women is important because it gives room for men who have a different voice to, to come forward. I've seen it so many times that you, you see guys and they're not the same. You know, they're not the same, but they they don't feel comfortable enough in expressing their views necessarily in predominantly male environment. However, I have no problem whatsoever. It's expected yeah. that I would have an alternative view. Actually, it wasn't expected at the start. We were supposed to be, we were soldiers become like men. I'm a soldier. I'm not a man. I'm a woman who's a soldier. So I think that, you know, a soldier can be a man or a woman. It doesn't have to be a man. You know, that's a soldier's lot. But again, I think introducing more diversity allows others to behave more um, in line with their conscience, in line with their way of thinking. Because we don't, they're not all the same, thankfully. Thanks very much. Yeah, Bernie. Good morning, I just want to say just uh, congratulations on, on what has been a very successful career in the Defence Forces and the many doors that you opened for, for, for women. Um, just, just in relation to the kind of the unique position you have at the moment in OMA, is there a particular TCC that is an exemplar in, in how they manage gender affairs or their composition the roles that they have women in and you know lessons learned that could be passed on to other TCCs including Ireland? Um, the Scandinavians do it very well but at the, at the moment they have other things on their mind um, but they're not turning their back on the UN they are working together actually as a matter of interest they're going to work together and perhaps not have representative from one, t from one Scandinavian country they'll have a rotating uh, kind of environment. Um, do you know who does it very well are the Ghanaians they have a huge number of female female personnel. The, uh, in fact, the deputy force commander in uh, Minerso in Western Sahara is a woman. And the lady who took over from me in Undaf is from Ghana. They have, and, and they really, they do very well. The trouble is that most of the women are involved in teaching, military college, and only a few of them, like this lady, one of them is, is naval. So, you know, they've got operational experience, we'll say. So I, I think they've done, I think that it is just about inclusion. And I think that's the lesson when you have, go into, so if you go into a mission and you see women doing patrols, um, doing the order, driving the APC, you then see them in the sector headquarters, being in charge of operations, are working in the intelligence, are working in logistics. And then you see, in my case, um, uh, an acting force commander. I would, the point you made about, and I've said, that if we have to be seen to give that, uh, to let people understand that you can be a female and be uh, a general as well. So I met my, my I visited all the missions and it, I had to go to every post because I just wanted to be seen, not, not for Maureen O'Brien, but for, for to give lessons, not lessons, but to show that it can be done. And I wasn't just a token. You know, I was talking about operational matters. I wasn't talking about um, painting my nails or plaiting my hair, mm. you know. So that came as a shock. And, re and I know that a lot of women since then reached out to me how they found that quite an inspirational and they will bring it home. So who we learn from, I, I think we do, do it quite well ourselves. You know, if you look at the... Um, 
if you look at what we do in terms of the roles that women play, I think we're very, very good. Thank you, Maureen. I, I have a question here from Dr. Sally Anne Corcoran. She's former of UN um, and she's in Galway, but currently Pavy Point, Dublin. What, in your opinion, would contribute most to the dismantling of the discriminatory structures, UN and military, that impact women on the ground and how to change people's perceptions about women and our contribution? It's probably building on a lot of the points you've been mm. making. Is there any... I, see, I don't know what bit is discriminatory. You know, when, when if something is discriminatory, I like to call it out. Yeah. All my life I've just said, but you can't do that. Yeah. So, but some people don't feel, and that's okay for me to say as a general, call it out. But I called it out when I was a second lieutenant. Yeah. But that was okay for me because I was brand new and a woman and what did you expect? And you didn't, you know. Um, but now I think a lot of women say in that they just are, their voices are, are, are being lost. So discrimination. Say it again, what is it? Just uh, dismantling discriminatory structures. And I suppose that's basically yeah. the patriarchal society that, are, that is institutionalized in, in many countries, but also in the military. Mm. And I suppose that's what we're talking about in terms of 1325, which is attempting to dismantle that. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, basically is getting, first of all, getting women there, get them in positions of authority, grow, grow the people from, I mean, actively grow from being a, a P5 or a P3, working their way up and giving them people UN experience. And I think if people act with, the, with that experience and on, when I go to a mission, people just say, you know, I give them where I've been. I yeah. came to the UN headquarters and I said, I've been in seven different missions. I don't have to justify myself to anyone. I had seven times more service in UN missions than anybody else had. So I, I think there's a lot of just do it yeah, yeah. in this and um, call it out. And, I, you know, I think the UN is trying very, very hard to ensure that their representation at all the levels. Now, sometimes women themselves don't want to take up those appointments. The field appointments aren't popular in all cases, especially at family, if they're having families at particular times. And that's OK, too. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of men are doing that. One of the, the easier things is to have fam if there are family friendly missions. Yeah. But they're less and less family friendly. Can I just take up a question there from Jill Dunno, who is Deputy Director of uh, General of IIEA? She said the example you gave of choosing one TC see you over another because of its better level of female representation in senior positions was, was impressive. But she makes the point in, in a climate where it's difficult to get TCCs in the first place, how ca far can you push that point? Exactly. It's a balance, right? Yeah. And so, you know, we make a lot of balances. When we bring a TCC, some we have concerns about the of their performance. Um, we do pre-deployment training, and we're not always 100% happy. Yeah. And we get them to redo stuff and all that kind of thing. We're not 100% happy, but at some stage, you got to say, yes. Now, we we're talking about standards. Your standards of equipment, we're talking about, do they have their, their drills down, you know, immediate action on IEDs, all that kind of stuff. But in fact, what we found, many of those TCs, without the normal structures of training that we would associate with, are so brave and do the work. I mean... For example, the Chadians, they're not perfect in everything, but my gosh, are those men, mostly men and some women, um, are extraordinarily brave. And I, I, I admire that. But the UN can't allow, you see, the balance. Yeah, yeah. We can't allow them to do that and expose themselves and then trying to get the balance of, um, we'll say, you know, TCCs that have more, uh, more structured okay. trainings. Keen, you have a question back there, Keen, from the IIEA. Thank you. I'm Keen Fitzgerald. I'm the security and defense researcher here at the IIEA. Uh, we see that some mercenary groups are now offering an alternative to UN assistance from host country, for host country governments for security. Most of these groups don't require security sector reform or implementation of 1325. I was just was wondering, how has this changed the operating environment for, for UN forces, as well as what does this mean for the potential continuity of some missions that are under threat by increased mercenary activity in those operating environments? Thank you. Increased mercenary, is that what you're saying? Yeah. I missed the first part of the sentence. Just increased mercenary activities where they're offering an alternative to UN forces for stability missions. First of all, they're not offering an alternative to stability. They're just not doing that. They're there for, I mean, it will become obvious in time that they're there for their own good. Nobody does this. Nobody does what, what those groups are doing. 
for their own benefit. And it will become very clear when their gold and their diamonds disappear. But again, as I mentioned, the people who are in charge at that moment and that time are gaining something from this relationship. It is only through democratization and, and, and um, capacity building in their governments and uh, that, that this will change. So what we have an example of the East African force that came into Congo. Now, we knew at the start that they couldn't achieve what they claimed they were going to achieve. Congo were, had disinformation about, about our, our mission there. They're saying we can't do it. We can't do it because they won't let us do it. And they won't let this group do it either. And this group also wants the UN to pay them and, and equip them. So long run, the UN survives. Long run, the UN has successful missions. Not always brilliant, not all, but we do save lives. And we do, and there's not any, I don't think there's anyone, any of those mercenaries who can say that. And to a larger extent, we do not leave the country in a worse position than, than, than we found it. And at least we're trying to do that. And we're accountable. We're accountable to all the member states, all the member states, of which some, you know, those mercenaries, where those mercenaries come from. So the mercenaries are not accountable. They, the, T, the host country knows the UN is accountable. Are you confident, uh, this is from Tom Crowley, that gender parity will be achieved by 2028? Not in your nanny goat. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no. Okay. Oh, well, and the difficulty is because in most of the TCCs, we don't have those levels in the, mission, in the military anyway. So how could we expect a larger number to be the UN when there's a fewer in, yeah, yeah. in the forces that exist? So basically, it's back to the member states again. The yeah. UN isn't, isn't, the UN is the member states. The member states have to try harder to increase those numbers. And maybe, maybe the military is not a good job for them. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question here from, sorry, does anybody want, else want to come in here, please? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Walt Kilroy from Dublin City University. Thanks for the uh, very interesting and inspiring presentation. I'm wondering, uh, I, I've, I'm very interested in this idea of a, I don't know, do we call it trickle down or, or trickle up in which um, involvement in the UN is actually changing the nature of the armed forces of the TCCs. How far do you think that's gone? Are you actually seeing real change happening uh, within the TCCs or is that process only just beginning? Um... You see, the UN doesn't see itself as a military organization. And we, we assume when we have a TCC that they come equipped and trained. What we find is they aren't, to a certain extent. Um, it, there are changes. And how we do that is through some bilateral arrangements. So we have, set, we have a, a section in, in the UN that deals with partnerships between um, one TCC and another potentially, either through training or sharing of equipment or that kind of thing. So that's how we're changing. Yes, for example, you can't get an APC in this world for UN missions. It's very difficult because they're all going someplace else. Um, but there, some people can help. Um, so that's how it's been done. I, I There are changes in the militaries. But what we're particularly interested in doing is growing the leadership um, because the leadership, the, 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 the NCO, for example, is the, the leader of the future, the junior leader of the future. So I think that um, whereas the change is slow, there's some, hap there's some happening. But there, there, there's some, uh, some difficult roads ahead as well, yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, Mike. Michael Finn, Major General. Yeah, sorry, just uh, Maureen, just uh, congratulations again on your you. on your appointment in New York and uh, um, and and for your interesting presentation here this evening. Uh, sorry, Michael Finn is my name. I've previously been been uh, uh, head of mission and and for, chief of staff of a small UN mission, UNSO, the oldest UN mission. But I remember going to UNSO in 1995, and and there was fierce excitement, I suppose, of the. Of the of the first uh, female observer, military observers coming into the mission, they were from Scandinavia at the time. Oh. But uh, I went back there in 2015, 2013 to 15 as a, as a head of mission, and you know there was a 
I have a lot more women in the mission, which is great. Some in senior appointments within us, Chief Observer Group Lebanon, and uh, uh, you yourself were Deputy Deputy Force Command or Deputy uh, Chief in UNDAF. Uh, but overall, and I think I'm probably repeating what's said already, isn't like th 1325 is around for a lot, very long time. And of course, there's been progress since in, in relation to the, the employment and deployment and offering of females on, on missions, both operational and, and staff appointments. But isn't there a long way to go? And isn't it, isn't it uh, restricted by the fact that TCCs, as hard as they, they might be trying, and some probably are not trying very well, but uh, they're restricted in the number of females in the national forces, in the troop country, troops mm. countries, and that will always be, be a challenge that will yeah. have us coming back in years ahead. Absolutely. Finding this out as a problem. And actually, there was a, the role that you held was held by a Norwegian woman at some stage as well. Mm. Yeah. And you'll find Norwegian women and Swedish women in as on more position, but you'll see a lot of Indians, Pakistani women, and Bangladesh women going as well because they want to increase their numbers. But what I found in some of the missions is they're not actually qualified. And I, I have looked at the when we select them to make sure that they are actually qualified because it's unfair again in terms of giving a burden to somebody that they cannot uh, they cannot achieve. So. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that happened, I noticed in Unso, there was a nun mo when I was over there in the middle of COVID, and she, they work in 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 Syria as well, and she was um, a, a surgeon, a lumbar, no, uh, she worked with, I don't know what the, the title was, she was a surgeon for the chest, right? I said, she's coming over to my side, because there's a, hotel, there's a hospital on my side, and if we needed somebody, she'd be there. But to me, that is a huge waste of talent to have a surgeon there. But what it meant for her is when she goes back to her country, she can work at the headquarters. I don't want to say too much more because you'll identify the country, but she, she's guaranteed, she knows where she's going to go and she's going to be promoted. So she wanted to do that. And the country wanted to do that because they wanted to tick a box. Yeah. Well, I think we're coming towards the end and I, I suppose I'll just make an observation and General Cudmore, you'll recall we had this conversation many times, the, the issue of gender equality and empowerment of women, it's not just about political correctness, it's not about, you know, a, a better reflection of the society you defend, protect and serve. It's not about just access to 50% of the population. It's, it's about capability. And as long as you do not have gender equality and empowerment of women in our forces, you have suboptimal capability and you bear risk and it should be on risk registers. Maureen, fantastic, open, mm -hmm. frank, honest discussion. Thank you. And uh, also, once again, congratulations on your award with uh, NUIG. It's so richly deserved. I want to say thanks, thanks to everybody here and everybody online. Thank you. Thank you.